Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help me out by clicking the subscribe or the like button. You can also leave me a comment wherever you listen to this podcast. So I wish I was coming at you today with uh, more positive news, but unfortunately we had a, a few bad readouts this week that I'm going to get into. So we're going to talk about the patent issue with Amarin. Also going to follow up with the failed phase 3 trial from Axon Therapeutics. And then we're going to finish up talking about Athersis and their multi-stem product that they're looking to get approved for acute respiratory distress syndrome. So yeah, it's going to be a tough show, i got to be honest. The, uh, the first two topics are positions that I've lost some money in, and then the last one, I've gotten a lot of people requesting for me to talk about Athersis, and I know when I have a lot of people asking me about that, there's, uh, there's a lot of emotions invested into it, so... You know, keep in mind that these are only my opinions, and uh, you don't have to call me names if you disagree with me. You can just move on with your day. But yeah, I have some some interesting things that I want to talk about today, so let's uh, get into it. And the first thing I want to talk about is the COVID-19 situation. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because everybody's probably watching the numbers go up daily, but it's uh, still looking kind of bleak. The Increases in cases in the USA continue to rise daily, and that's a problem. I think what I'm keeping my eye on is flattening of the daily increases in cases. And once that starts to happen, there's some room for optimism, even though the numbers for each different state are going to accelerate and decelerate at different times. So it's a, it's kind of a tough thing to monitor. But we do kind of see a slight slowdown in Italy, so there's some good news there for Europe. California, where, where I'm at, is seems to be okay. The, uh, the population in California is really big compared to a lot of the other states, but it seems to be flattening the curve to some extent. We do see increases, though, in Michigan and Louisiana, and that might be a, a cause for concern, but we're seeing these headlines now of healthcare resources being needed pretty badly, and the government's trying to do what they can to keep the resources here in the United States. But it's going to be some tough road ahead for us, I think, um, and hopefully we can flatten the curve enough where it's not going to be that big of a burden on the healthcare system. One thing that I would like to note is that we're not really seeing much serological testing going on, and this I think should be a big focus of the government, given that we need to know who has already had the disease or who's been exposed so that people can get back to work and we can kind of restart the economy again. And we're not going to know that until this serological testing happens. And this testing, it, it tests for antibodies that show that you've been exposed to the disease such that you're not at, a, at risk of contracting it anymore. So having this testing roll out is going to be critical in the next little while, and I hope that we focus our efforts on that so we can get back to work and get the economy going again. But when it comes to the biotech sector itself, there's a lot of companies who are kind of pivoting towards COVID-19, which is nice, but for those smaller ones that don't really have a focus on infectious disease, we're starting to see that cash really does become essential. And if trials are going to be delayed, companies aren't going to want to lay off staff and then having to rehire them. So if they can maintain their position without needing to shake up their business too much, that is advantageous. And we're starting to see that a lot of companies are delaying their trials or postponing them so that the COVID-19 disease doesn't interfere with some of the data that comes out, which makes sense. So that's all I'm going to say. It's, uh, it's not looking good for us right now in the United States, and hopefully we can flatten the curve enough to allow us to, to chug forward and, and push through this. But, you know, I am cautiously optimistic. I think we will get through it, and then hopefully the lessons we take from this pandemic we can use towards the future, and uh, it won't be as bad as it was this time. But with that, let's get to a topic that is dear to me, which is Amarin. They are the Omega-3 company that I've been talking about for the last few years now, and they recently got approval for Vasipa from the FDA, the supplemental NDA that they submitted to treat patients of all sorts of different triglyceride levels. But what happened was, once the data started coming out that Vasipa was able to lower triglycerides to a significant degree and that this lowering actually correlated very well with the reduction in major cardiovascular events, we started to see generic companies come on the scene and they filed abbreviated new drug applications with the FDA. And this is in order for them to sell generic versions of Vasipa. Now, Amarin does have patents that protect Vasipa, 
So when Ameren noticed that this was happening, they went ahead and sued these companies for patent infringement. So this was taken up in the District Court of Nevada, and it was presided by Judge Miranda Dew. And after going back and forth, listening to the plaintiffs and the defendants, the judge ruled that the companies were infringing, but that the patent claims are obvious and thus they are invalid. So this ruling means that there is no patent protection for Vasipa in the USA, and therefore should pave the way for generic companies to file these ANDAs with the FDA, and then they can sell generic Vasipa. So I'm not a patent attorney, in case I didn't make that clear before, but, you know, I do know a little bit, and I'm going to kind of put my flavor on, on this whole situation. And I don't want to stew too much on the decision, even though I do disagree with it, obviously, but let's talk a little bit about what is required for patent protection. And you have to file a patent in the United States, anyway, with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And ideally, your patent, what you want in it, is that your invention is statutory, which means that it's covered under a regulatory body at which the USPTO is able to enforce. The invention has to be new, it has to be useful, and it also has to be non-obvious. So these are the ways in which, if you want to infringe on a patent, you would argue that the patent is not valid because the claims made under this patent do not meet the requirements for being statutory, new, useful, or non-obvious. And the one that seems to be the most subjective is this non-obviousness. As you can imagine, it's a subjective thing to decide that whether uh, an invention is obvious or not when the patent was filed. What people use to determine obviousness is laid out right here, and I'm just going to read this quote that I took. So, this determination is made by deciding whether the invention sought to be patented would have been obvious to a person having ordinary skill in the art to which the claimed invention pertains. And this doesn't mean at the time at which it's adjudicated, it means that when the patent was actually filed, that a person having ordinary skill in the art to which the claimed invention pertains would think it's obvious. Patent attorneys have to go back if they're going to, you know, take this case up, and they have to look at prior art, which means anything that was filed, anything on the record that shows that a person living in 2008 in the case of Asipa would have thought that this was obvious. So the defense brought up some studies, this Mori published in 2000, and then another one from Hayashi in Kurabayashi, and then they also brought up the Lavaza approval. And so the, the two ones that I want to talk about, so Lavaza is the, the drug that has both EPA as well as DHA, and this omega-3 actually decreases triglycerides as well, but it happens to increase LDLC. And this is a contentious point because it's what kind of helped the decision here. This Mori 2000 study showed that pure EPA alone is able to reduce triglycerides as well as lower LDLC, but it didn't do it under a patient population of severe hypertriglyceridemia, which is what Ameren's patent actually covers. So, you know, let's not focus too much on the decision that was made. Obviously, I disagree with it. I think that the fact that Ameren had to go through a major cardiovascular outcome study, this five-year trial that took a lot of money and a lot of time to show that there's an actual benefit to Vasipa shows that this is not obvious to somebody in the art. But, you know, it's not up to me. It's up to a uh, district judge. So let's talk about what, what the steps forward are. And really, they can file an appeal, and they can also file an injunction. And when it comes to the appeal process, they have to file with the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, and a great article that I read from MarkmanAdvisors.com, this was published by Zachary Silbersher, and he's done a few articles on Vasipa and Ameren, and I think you should read them all. It gives a very good perspective from somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, because obviously that's not me. I'm more of the science business guy, but um, I'm going to read a quote here when it comes to the appeal from his point of view, and he says that, On the one hand, the ultimate legal conclusion of obviousness is assessed de novo, which means that the federal circuit is not obligated to defer to the district court. That's good for Ameren because it means that the court can technically make up its own mind whether the patents are obvious. On the other hand, any factual findings determined by the judge should, technically, be subject to deference by the federal circuit. They are reviewed only for clear error. That requires that the federal circuit find that a clear mistake was made rather than finding that the appellate court disagrees with the finding by the district court. That will technically make it harder for Ameren to argue that certain factual findings underpinning the judge's obviousness determination were erroneous. 
So all that is to say that the burden of proof now rests on Amron not to show that necessarily that they disagree with the judge's outcome, but that Judge Miranda Dew in the Federal District Court of Nevada made an error. What Zachary thinks is the best move forward for Amron is that they can argue two things based on the different bench orders that the, the judge made. And one is that, you know, they can argue that it was surprising that the EPA would not increase LDLC in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia. And they can also argue that the court did not apply the law of secondary considerations properly. So when it comes to this EPA in the severe triglycerides, apparently the judge didn't really believe Amarin that it was important that the level of triglycerides mattered when it came to the obviousness of EPA having an effect on LDLC. Because the judge threw that out, Amarin can argue here that the factualness of the prior art shows that the severe triglyceride levels were relevant when it came to the effect on EPA in lowering LDLC. When it comes to the second thing, like I said, I am not a patent attorney, but questioning whether the court correctly applied the law of secondary considerations. So when I mentioned that the, the primary consideration really is whether or not somebody who's skilled in the art would think that it's obvious if they had all the tools at their disposal at the time at which it was filed. But courts also, and there's case law that shows this, courts also take into consideration what they call secondary considerations. And I have written down here that I pulled that it's important to note that secondary considerations are by no means secondary in importance, only secondary in sequence after analysis of the traditional obviousness considerations. These secondary considerations might refer to any benefits to the patents maintaining their validity. So if, for instance, invalidating these patents is going to lead to the death of thousands of people, the judge might take that into consideration and rule that the patents should remain valid for these secondary considerations. Now, what Judge Dew did when it came to these secondary considerations that Amron provided is she weighed them against themselves. So she took, say, four of them that were laid out, and I don't know if this is actually, this is an example, and she said that two of these secondary considerations argue in favor for keeping the patents valid, and two of them argue in favor of making them invalid. And then she said, therefore, these secondary considerations cancel themselves out, and I'm not going to consider them further. What Zachary kind of outlines is that that's not how secondary considerations are usually applied when it comes to case law that's looked at. So he says that Amron can argue in a court that these secondary considerations weren't applied correctly and that this was an error made by the court. So where does that kind of leave us today? And given that they filed the appeal and that generic companies have not gotten an approved ANDA yet, Amron has said that they're prepared to launch an injunction if they do get an approval for an abbreviated new drug application. And Amron also argues that if they're approved and launched, the generic companies do face some liability in the event that Amron wins the appeal. And this is true, Zachary did talk about this in his article, that a lot of times generic companies won't launch their product until they know that there's no appeal going on because all of the losses that Amron would have had given that the generics were launched might all need to be repaid by the generic companies in the case that they do win the appeal. So uh, we could get a delay, and, and that's what Amron's hoping on, but they are prepared to launch an injunction. The other thing that Amron says is that generics don't have the resources, know-how, and time to meet the demand. And there's also peculiarities of the product, like product stability as well as oxidation that need to be taken into consideration that generics might not have thought of. And, you know, I can kind of attest to this that you don't just simply produce omega-3s and then you can just sell them. There's a lot of R&D that goes into producing them and to maintaining the uh, stability of the compound. I've personally worked with some fish oil diets in my past life, and I know that we've had issues that once these fish oil di diets are exposed to air for too long, the product oxidizes and it's no longer functional. So there are actual issues surrounding the manufacturing that the generics are going to have to work out. And also, it's important to note that Amarin does have patent protection in the EU and Canada, so it would be wise for Amarin to focus on those markets. And so where we're left off with, Amron now has a market cap as of Friday the 3rd of $1.72 billion, and they have net current assets of $612 million. So it's not too bad. They're trading at around three times what their cash position is. I kind of put my you know keyboard jockey uh, chance at appeal of around 20%. 
given the issues that Zachary brought up from Markman Advisors, but I don't really know. And I think that 20% might be generous, it might not be, but clearly the market is, is pricing a slight chance at appeal after the interview that Jeffrey's Michael Yee kind of showed earlier in the week, but I don't really know what to think. The advantages that Amron has right now, obviously, are that they've launched a sales force already, and like I mentioned, they figured out manufacturing and production. They've already launched their product, so they're already hitting the road running, whereas these generic companies are going to have their work cut out for them. The other thing is that Amron's going to have the data that supports their compounds specifically and not the generics, even though oftentimes this, this isn't a huge deal for generics to overcome because they say that functionally it is the same product. So for me, I'm holding like 213 shares of Amron, and my cost basis is 17 and change. So I lost a substantial amount of money on this one, and I'm disappointed in that. But I'm not too sure what I want to do. If I want to double down and lower my cost basis, I think my price target originally was around 30. And, you know, after this, they're going to lose a substantial amount of prescriptions to generics. And we just don't know to what degree that is going to occur. And, you know, if I say that they're going to lose maybe half of their value, that puts their price at like $15. And that means that I'm going to have to double down on my position in order to lower my cost basis. And I'm not sure if emotionally I'm ready for that, but I'm, uh, I'm going to take some time and wait for the news to kind of sit with me for a bit and then decide what to do from there. Because if I think about it, I could probably put that money to use into a higher chance of return in some other company rather than just waiting for the next year or so as all of this gets hammered out. So that's Amarin. It's disappointing. And, uh, you know, I'm right there with you guys if uh, you took a bet on this as well and lost. So it uh, doesn't always work out in our way, but it is what it is. Let's move on and talk about Axome Therapeutics, which also isn't a very positive story. There's a little bit of a, of a silver lining here because they are going to be able to submit an NDA for another indication, but Axon Therapeutics released their data on treatment-resistant depression, and they were comparing their drug, which is AXS05, which is a combination of dextromethorphan as well as bupropion, compared to patients treated with bupropion alone. And what the company released is that at week 1 and 2, there was a significant improvement with AXS05, but at week 6, which was the primary endpoint, the p-value was only 0.117, and it did not reach uh, statistical significance. Now, the company will argue that overall, if you take kind of the area under the curve here, there was a significant decrease in this Madras score, which is what they use for depression. But at that week six time point, it didn't reach statistical significance, so technically the trial fails. But they're very optimistic about this, and they still are going to move forward with a, a, another trial in phase three to confirm these results. And I think they're doing this because of the secondary outcomes, which were positive, and they looked at a cognition endpoint as well as a remission statistic. And those both did show statistical significance in the AXS05 group. So I think they're positive on this and they think that the FDA is going to look at this in a, in a positive way rather than seeing this as a failure. So they're moving forward with a, another phase three in Q3 of 2020, and they're going to need to get guidance from the FDA in determining what they should set as the primary endpoint, because this is going to be pretty important on whether or not the FDA is going to accept a, an NDA or supplemental NDA in this case. You know, I don't see this as a total failure. I think the odds of them actually getting approval for this aren't that low, given that the compound has such a profound effect in major depressive disorder, and that in treatment-resistant depression, physicians don't really have many options. So I think the FDA will look at this and, and decide to go along with it and approve it. So the company itself is going to move forward with the NDA submission in Q4 of 2020, and they're going to look at uh, major depressive disorder as the indication. And then after they get the data from the second phase three of treatment-resistant depression, they're going to file a supplementary NDA for that indication. And then we're also going to look forward to some catalysts in two, Q2 of 2020. One is the Alzheimer's disease agitation, and another one is migraine. So the company's value went down quite a bit on the news of the treatment-resistant depression, but I think it's a good opportunity to pick up some more, and I'm going to do that, I think, this week in anticipation of positive news on these other two catalysts, but also I think that they still hold a lot of potential for the, the market cap they're, that they're trading at right now. 
that's where I with Axome. Some disappointing news, but I think there is a silver lining here, so I definitely still think that the company's buy in, in the mid-50s. So let's get to the final topic of today, and that is Athersis. And Athersis has been around for a while now. Price closed at $2.88 a share on Friday the 3rd of April, and that puts their market cap at $472 million, uh, and they have net current assets of $24 million. So you can see here that they're already trading at quite a premium for the amount of cash they have on hand. And part of the reason for that is that they've come up with this multi-stem cell therapy, is what they call it. It's a cell therapy of multipotent adult progenitor cells that they've taken from the bone marrow of adults, and then they've expanded it in culture and made kind of a, a cell bank for it. And they're characterized by low expression of MHC class 1, CD44, CD90, and CD49C, and they're negative for MHC class 2, CD45, and CD106. So all that is to say that they're kind of a rare stem cell population, and they're different than mesenchymal stem cells. So a lot of the stem cell therapies you'll see advertised are these MSCs, and they've been shown to improve inflammation in a variety of different conditions. But this multi-stem cell therapy are these MAPCs, and they also have an effect on lowering the immunologic response or inflammation as well. But it's not entirely clear the mechanism of action, how it works. But basically, in different conditions like stroke or myocardial infarct, you infuse these stem cells, and they're apparently supposed to improve the outcomes of people undergoing treatment and, and repair after they've suffered these conditions. So the, the reason why we're talking about them today is that they also have an indication for acute respiratory distress syndrome. And if you know anything about the COVID-19 situation, a lot of patients are dying due to acute respiratory distress syndrome caused by pneumonia caused by SARS-CoV-2. So Athersis is kind of seizing on the opportunity here to get their treatment approved so that they can start treating these COVID-19 patients with their multi-stem cell therapy and improve outcomes. So what I'm showing here is their phase one and two data that they presented at a conference in early 2019, I believe. So the trial that they did here was an exploratory phase one and two, and it was specifically looking for safety. So let me just put that from the outset. The primary endpoint was for a frequency of sustained hypoxemia or hypotension, and also suspected unexpected serious adverse reactions. Now, what they showed here is a study where they looked at 30 patients, 20 of them were on multi-stem and 10 of them were on placebo. They originally talked about how it was supposed to be a uh, dose trial. Some patients were supposed to get low dose multi-stem, some high dose, but they didn't really talk about that in, in detail. They just said that the 20 multi-stem patients received 900 million multi-stem cells. And so after they were treated with that, they measured the number of ventilator-free days, the number of ICU-free days, the mortality, and then they kind of partitioned the patients from those that had very low pulmonary function just to see how the treatment affected those patients. And so what we see here is that the multi-stem cell therapy led to an increase in the number of ventilator-free days and also an increase in the number of ICU-free days. And the mortality was also decreased by around 15% compared to placebo. Now, one thing you might notice here is that there is no baseline data given and there's also no safety data given. That would have been useful, I think, given that this is a phase one and two trial, that we see exactly the number of safety issues that happen and what they were. Now, they do say that there was no difference in safety between both treatment and placebo, but I would have liked to actually see them and see the details here. When they look at the, the patient subset that is particularly low pulmonary function, we do see a substantial improvement in ventilator-free days, ICU-free days, as well as mortality. But I gotta say, with only 30 patients total, I don't put too much stock into this data. They said also that this study wasn't powered for um, efficacy, but they're only showing us efficacy. So, you know, it does make me a little suspicious that if we move forward to a phase three trial, are we going to see the same thing? Or is it going to be just luck of the draw that uh, the multi-stem happened to show improvement in ventilator-free days? So this doesn't really put a nail in the coffin that this is an effective therapy yet, even though the company is touting this as a true victory. So Athersis also has a partnership with a company in Japan called Helios, 
and they're launching a phase two efficacy trial to see in another group of patients, are they going to see effectiveness from multi-stem cell therapy in patients that have ARDS caused by pneumonia. And Helios has mentioned that COVID-19 patients are eligible, so they're gonna be able to enroll these patients specifically and see whether or not multi-stem infusions can improve the number of ventilator-free days. They're looking to enroll 30 patients with an estimated completion date of Q2 of 2021, so that's about a year from now, but that does include a six-month follow-up time point. So the initial data might come up uh, six months before that, which would put it at, say, like Q4 of 2020. And the primary outcome is ventilator-free days for a 28 days after administration of multi-stem cell therapy. So a couple things based on this stand out to me, and that is they're only looking to enroll 30 patients. And if it's going to be similar to the study before, you know, it's just not going to show very much statistical significance. It's not going to be powered well enough to get that data that we want that shows that there's no question that the multi-stem cell therapy is effective. The other thing is that we're not going to see data on this until late 2020. And I'm going to go to the next slide that shows a little bit more details on my verdict here, but the company might need to raise money in that time, and that is a cause for concern when it comes to investing today. And then finally, I don't know if ventilator-free days is necessarily what the FDA is going to require before they go ahead and, uh, and approve this therapy for acute respiratory distress syndrome. My verdict on, on all of this is a pass, and I know this is going to be disappointing to a lot of people who are excited about this company, but I'm concerned for a couple things. I think that they're going to need to raise money soon. The cash they have on hand is only like, what did I say? $24 million, and they burn around $50 million per year. And this isn't including money that they're, they're spending right now for their phase three stroke trial. And that data is going to come out in Q4 of 2021, although they might have an interim time point before then. But with that low amount of money right now, they're going to have to raise soon, and that's just going to come in the form of a dilution of the stock. The other thing that you need to be mindful of is that the stock is already trading at 20 times the net current assets. So for that reason, it's not really an attractive bet for me. Now, when it comes to the Helios trial itself, the low patient number isn't really encouraging to me to see actual effectiveness. I think I've seen a lot of trials that are closer to the 100 patient range, and I think that's more appropriate when it comes to looking at a trial that's powered for efficacy. The other thing that I want to mention is that I'm not sure what the endpoints the FDA wants in order to get the indication for acute respiratory distress syndrome. And if somebody has that, feel free to tweet me at Matthew Lepoir and let me know where I'm off on this, but I'm not too sure what they're going to need. And then this Helios trial, we don't know if it's an actual pivotal trial or they're going to need another phase three trial that's going to allow them to submit their NDA or in this case a biologics license application before they can actually hit the market and start selling this stuff and uh, and helping out patients. So for me this is a little bit too much uncertainty. If uh, new data comes out of this Helios trial we get an interim result or something that shows that the multi stem cell therapy is effective and it works then I'm willing to change my opinion but today I'm, uh, I'm not confident enough to put a position on. So that's where I'm at with Atherosis. Uh, let me know what you think. You know, leave me a comment in the YouTube or send me a tweet. So what we have in the next couple weeks, there should be some axome readout, I think, on AD agitation in AXS05. So I'm going to be keeping my eye out on that. Um, we're also going to see some updates from Gilead and Remdesivir for COVID-19. And if we start to see data with that, um, you know, we could see some bullish turnaround in the market if... Remdesivir happens to be particularly effective at curbing the effects of COVID-19, then, you know, really the whole economy could turn around if this starts going. So that's something to definitely be mindful of. Um, I'm kind of looking around for companies that are on sale right now. One in particular is Exact Sciences, and they're trading around 50 bucks a share. And I think that is an attractive thing, given that their company doesn't rely on face-to-face -face interaction. They just send up the test kit, somebody gives them the sample, and they send it back. Now, obviously, people are less concerned about colorectal cancer than, say, infectious disease, but I think that it is a company to keep an eye on, and I'm thinking about taking a position in the next week or so. So given that we're in a whole downturn of the market, it's important to take some time and, you know, evaluate companies that have some staying power once the market does turn around. So other things that I'm keeping mindful of is the continued COVID-19 fallout. So unemployment claims have increased even more. I think the number 
of uh, initial claims was 6.6 .6 million on Thursday, and then we saw that unemployment hit 4.4% in the USA yesterday. So, you know, those numbers are just going to get worse. And for me, what I'm looking at is the daily increases in numbers in the USA. And once that starts to plateau, you know, the bottom might be in. And I think originally I said that, that late April is when that's going to happen, and I still think that we're on course for that. The daily numbers do seem to increase, although the rate that which that's happening is starting to slow down, but we need to find a peak of daily increases, and then I think we can say that, okay, the bottom is starting to come in, and we can kind of start looking at an economic recovery, but I don't think the V-shaped recovery that people are anticipating is going to happen. Like, if anything, it'll be more U-shaped, or that reverse uh, Nike swoosh is more likely, so we'll see. I'm going to do a quick portfolio wrap-up which should be no surprise to anybody given the disaster that Ameren had. Overall, I'm negative at 37.7 for the year. And uh, you can see here, I just tore away from my competitors in the, the indices and I'm doing much worse than all of them. I think the, the Dow Jones is coming in second at like negative 27 for the year, but Ameren just killed me this, this week. Other things to note that I did, I sold my iAvance. I, I kind of mentioned it in my previous video that, you know, I don't want to wait for the buyout rumor to materialize. I'd rather just take profits right now and uh, leave it at that. They have been dipping a little bit, so I might re-enter. I'm not sold one way or another, but I do like the company. Now, in terms of volatility, it got crushed in absolutely every index here. So we might see a bit of a, of a relief rally earlier in the upcoming week. So keep your eye out on that. But... With that, I'm going to wrap it up. So I hope you all uh, enjoyed the episode. Let me know what you think. Leave me a comment. Leave me a like or subscribe. And uh, like I said, this is only my opinion, and I'm definitely willing to be proven wrong if things come out the other way. But with that, I do want to thank everybody for the support, and we'll see you next time.